Star Trek creator Gene Roddenberry set lofty standards for his visual effects designers and makeup artists. Everything the Enterprise encountered had to be based on some sort of scientific reality. That goes for Vulcans and Klingons. To ensure that his law was never forgotten, Roddenberry wrote a Star Trek Bible that is required reading for every effects specialist on board. One man this who carries on the Roddenberry tradition is Richard Snell, who received an Oscar Chad nomination for his makeup work stopped. in Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Snow Country. Gene Roddenberry, when he wrote the Star Trek Bible, had included a brief description of the backgrounds of Klingons. Uh, generally, they were reminiscent of the uh, Mongols. In previous movies, uh, up until five, actually, the Klingons had a real what I call a cookie cutter approach, where they just stamp out the same basic design over and over again. On Star Trek uh, V, we began to spread out the design so each Klingon could be individual. And with that ground being broken in five, on six, we had hundreds of different designs, which, uh, as a sculptor and artist, was what it was all about for me. We got to play. To be or not to be? That is the question which preoccupies our people, Captain Kirk. We need breathing room. Earth, Hitler, 1938. I beg your pardon. Well... Creating that Klingon look is a very involved process. But with the help of our model, Richard shows us how the Klingon look is accomplished. Well, the process begins by slicking back the actor's hair. This is a prosthetic adhesive. The actual edge of the prosthetic is as thin as a tissue paper. Subsequently, all these prosthetics are used only once. And this is a paint which has pigment put into it, which we call Pax paint. It's basically the same product with uh, water added, thinning it out. The hair goods we use are actually human hair. Each hair is hand tied into a little lace net, one hair at a time. The lace is glued in. And it virtually disappears. Minor things, such as these eyebrows going on at a certain angle, can really change the face of your makeup design. Go down at this angle, he tends to be perceived as not quite as innocent, almost <laughs> humorous. But if we take the eyebrows and we put it in an up angle, it's just something we innately as humans see as being more demonic or more evil. For Star Trek VI, we designed over 300 prosthetics that uh, had to be built, cast of hundreds. So we had quite a bit of makeup going on. It was a, an involved process. In the case of well, uh, Chris kind. Plummer, he wanted the evil not to be because of the makeup, but because of Sweet what was inside, what he was reading right. internally into the yeah. character. And he wanted to look like, Have unlike, rather, any other Klingon. And I suddenly realized that uh, he didn't want any hair at all. He wanted to be a bald, the first bald Klingon, which caused me great consternation because the whole backside of the head in this area, uh, I had virtually left unsculpted because I knew it was going to be covered by a wig. After that time, I sculpted through the night and molded through the night and didn't go to sleep and uh, got the product out a couple days later, and everyone was happy. And I have to say, in retrospect, it was a very good choice. Uh, Chris's choice for that design was right on the money. The eye patch actually has its own story. Um, we knew that the eye patch, we didn't want it to be attached in the normal manner, and we had considered tying it on with a string and knew that the Klingons wouldn't do it this way. Uh, Neela Rodas, the, uh, one of the artistic directors of the movie, decided uh, it'd be a good idea if it were bolted to the skull. Another interesting thing about the design and the attention to detail that we put into our characters, and this is probably never seen on screen, but I know it's there is the fact that each one of the sure. bolts that bolts the eye patch to Chang's head Sincere has a little Klingon emblem, kind of like a Phillips warrior. screwdriver, if you will. So, Trekkie fans, look for it. It's a foregone conclusion. None of these people have ever seen an extraterrestrial before. Snell is also in charge of producing the most famous prosthetic in movie history, Spock's Vulcan ears. Essentially, this is done the same way we do a prosthetic for the forehead for the Klingons. We take a casting of Mr. Nimoy's ears, then sculpt 
the ear tips on the ears, after which we go through design approval. Uh, there have been subtle differences throughout the years, you know, from 1965 till now, of, uh, of how they're sculpted and how they look. And Mr. Nemo is very particular about it. So this is uh, the molds that we use for that. What we do, this is a silicone mold. We have the ear on the inside with holes drilled into it. The holes are drilled there for the overflow of foam latex. Uh, when we inject the foam into here, it overflows and oozes out the top. We then bake it in an oven, and what comes out is a prosthetic like that. This is the foam, which uh, is basically rubber that's been whipped up to a consistency of meringue and then put into a large injection gun and injected into molds like these. It sets inside the mold, then we put these molds inside the oven. Uh, we have a couple of special ovens that uh, bake at exactly 200 degrees. And after about three hours, that vulcanizes the rubber and it becomes uh, permanently like this. It's like a sponge, very soft. And as you can see, it has these tissue thin edges and it can move quite well, which is how we get that movement in the forehead. If it's sculpted thin enough, you get a lot of movement in the forehead. So there they are, Spock's ears. Richard has worked on many different characters on many different movies. His makeup work can reflect as many varied emotions as the characters themselves. If we take the pupils away altogether, it takes on a completely new connotation. Not having pupils can be very disconcerting. Just like the NASA program that